Continuing on with the things that you may have read about that are often used as examples in the public mind matter interaction literature to justify that science has proven that this occurs and that it's a certain, it's a lock, you just can't go wrong with it. Princeton University had a long running lab called the Pear Lab, and it basically dealt with, it was Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab. Um, shortened to pair. And it, and it dealt with, the idea of it was actually very, very brilliant and very, very interesting. It was run by someone named Bob John, who was um, a professor at Princeton, and a psychologist named Brenda Dunn, who was for many years the lab manager. And the idea behind it was that John was a material physicist, materials physicist, and he was having materials engineer physicist type, and he was having um, issues with getting impurities totally out of things for uh, NASA. If you're doing stuff in space, very small impurities matter a great deal. And he started to wonder at a certain point if there was some other type of anomalous interaction that was going on, in other words, a mind-matter interaction, between materials that were producing these very small effects and operators that were, you know, making the materials or mod manipulating the materials, modifying them, whatever. And so we actually got a lab funded to look into that. And then over the subsequent uh, couple of decades that followed before the lab closed, which was very, in, in recent years, very recently, um, he wound up looking at all sorts of mind-matter interaction type of things. Now, the thing that makes his lab so notable is that he was and is an just incredibly anal researcher. And so you're talking about, you know, really a noted physicist at Princeton University who decided to turn his intellect on to trying to solve this problem of whether or not there was a mind-matter interaction that was, in essence, creating defects in certain materials. And went on from there to more broadly explore mind-matter interaction in general. Um, what, I, what you see here is just sort of some overall information that I've abstracted from their final paper uh, when they closed the lab. Now, they have a new book out, actually, um, and you can go to, um, you can see princeton.edu slash tilde pair slash, and you can still get to the lab's pages. They're still up there. The web pages are still up there. Uh, this is a link to the actual paper that I'm extracting this from, and it was really their final summary paper. So I've just pulled a few things out of here. The first thing that I want to note is at the very, very bottom of this graphic. It's the last bullet point. And if you go, say, four lines up from there, you can see it says, to summarize, the size of these deviations failed by an order of magnitude to attain to attain that of our prior experiments, or even to achieve a, a pervasive or persuasive level of statistical significance. What this is really saying is, and you can see a journal reference there if you want to actually look up the paper that talks more about this. What this is really saying is that there were three labs that tried to replicate the work that had been done for decades at the Pear Lab in Princeton and that replication failed. Replication is an extremely important thing in science. Science deals with not just doing one set of experiments in one place in one way, but trying to attack things from so many different angles that you really exclude any possibility, or as much as you can, uh, other possibilities and other possible explanations uh, if you're getting an effect. So if you're getting an effect, you're proving that the effect is there, or maybe you're making the effect go away by trying it from so many different angles. And if you have an effect and, you, and that effect is durable, then you're really trying to say, well, what do I have here? Is it, is it supporting this theory or another theory? Um, so when you have a situation where you've got a set of experiments over time and they're not able to be replicated in other labs, that is a huge problem within science. So what we have here with the Pear Lab 
is an interesting dilemma. And again, you know, Bob and Brenda, I know personally, I've sat down one-on-one -on -one with Bob and Brenda, and we've had um, discussions about this type of thing. Um, so this is not a situation where I'm just pulling information out from papers at a distance. I've done a lot of work. I've traveled around as much as I possibly can to meet people who are involved um, in this type of research to the extent that they're willing to be met. And Bob and Brenda were. So here we have a situation where we have a decades, couple of decades of scientific experimentation, very, very rigorous scientific experimentation done at a major university that when it tries to be replicated towards the end of this period, the replication fails. So we have some, we have some issues where we can't really say something is going on here without that replication occurring. And in fact, when I was, when I was talking to uh, Bob and Brenda, um, one of the things that Bob was very, very careful to say is that all they'd really proved over the course of their experimentation was that something might be going on. Not that something was definitively going on, but that something might be going on. So after 25 years of experimentation, basically, the best that they could do, coming at this from so many different angles with the brilliance of the minds that were involved in this project at Princeton, was that something might be going on. And part of the reason for that is because of failed replication that you see here, uh, but also because the more they instituted um, safeguards in their experimentation, the more the results went to random. So let me say that again. And this is something that you see in the, in the parapsychology, psychokinesis type literature quite a bit. Um, that the more trials you do, the more experiments you do, the less significant the results become. They may start out being highly significant, and that, but over time they will trend to be basically random, to not be significant. Um, so you saw the same thing happened basically with pear. It happened with um, all kinds of like dice experiments and things like that at a very famous uh, laboratory at Duke University, the uh, Rhine's uh, Research Laboratory. Um, now, what people say that are involved in this type of research is. Well, this deals with intent. And in the case of the Pear Lab, for instance, they had, um, they were using um, basically quantum level effects a lot of the time. Sometimes they were using mechanical level effects. Um, but they were basically trying to get people to intend to have either, for instance, more ones than zeros if it was an electronic apparatus um, or for if they were dropping steel balls, for instance, down sort of a random course uh, to have more of them show up on one side of the catcher than the other side of the catcher. Uh, so all sorts of different stuff like this, right? But it basically deals with mental intent. It's mind-matter interaction. It's trying to wish something at a macro level in reality. Um, a little bit less of a macro level, obviously, for the quantum level effects. But nonetheless, at a at a you know observable level, basically of reality, having more ones than zeros, even though it's being produced at the quantum level, is still more ones and zeros on an electrical readout. So their case that they make that people at the Rhine, uh, at the Duke uh, laboratory makes, etc., is essentially that. Well, you know, people's intent varies. They might start out very, very focused on the task, but over time that changes. And so over time you have a situation where uh, their, their performance basically decreases. They get tired, they get distracted, whatever. That's all well and good as an argument, except that the reason that you perform additional trials is so that you can make sure that when you reach a certain st statistically significant number, your results haven't gone to random. And the problem is that in most of these cases, with most of these types of experiments, they do. They go to random when you perform enough of them. So there's a couple of arguments against this type of research uh, from a scientific standpoint 
And those are two of the most powerful ones, failure to replicate and going to random, the more sort of controls that you introduce over time, the more trials that you introduce over time. And you can, in fact, see that in the third bullet point uh, with Bob and Brenda saying, you know, without contest, I'm sorry, the second to the bottom bullet point, without contest, the most challenging aspect of such anomalies uh, type of experimentation is the well-known propensity of the phenomena to manifest with only a regular replicability. Now let's look at some of these other bullet points up here. So the first, uh, the second, third, and fourth bullet points here, right underneath the link to the paper, um, these deal sort of with the overall population, with the overall research population, right? So overall there were 91 research participants, and in parenthesis you see the significance number. Um, a point zero seven is not a, statistic, a statistically significant number. What you really want there is 0 0.05 or something smaller than 0 0.05, right? So if we look at the entire research population across all of their trials, and you have to remember, it's very important to remember that this includes early trials um, where there weren't a lot of controls as well as later trials where there were a lot of controls, right? So, but some interesting statistics do emerge from this, right? So if you look across all 91 uh, people, basically all 91 research subjects, all the trials that those 91 people did, some did a lot more than others, uh, you have a 0 0.07, so no significance overall, in all in overall number of trials that they did trying to prove this phenomenon. So in other words, it's, it's trending in the direction of, a, of something. That's why he says, you know, there some, might be something going on here that's, that's trending towards a 0.05 level of significance, but it's not a 0.0 level 5. So you really can't say that there, that there is a statistical significance there. However, when you break it up into men and women, look at the difference there. 50 men, 41 women. Men, totally non-significant, right? 0.77. Women, very significant. Uh, 0 0.0036. That's a very significant result. And then if you try to divide it out and you say, well, were there people who were, who did a whole bunch of sessions and who seemed to be very um, able to produce changes, you know, someone has to do a certain number of sessions in order to be statistically significant in, the, in and of themselves. Um, and so you see that there were 20 people that were considered prolific by them. And, you know, four times 10 to the minus fourth is a highly significant um, number. And then the non-prolific people, if you look at them, well, you wind up with 71 people. Um, remember, there's 91 total and no level of significance there at all, 0.79. And then what about men and women? If we divide it down into men and women, with prolific males and prolific females, we're still seeing the prolific females. We're seeing the women effect, right? So a huge significance in these 11 women's results. Um, so it's really quite interesting uh, that it did seem like some people who did do enough statistically significant work, um, you can say there was a possible effect for. So in the Paralab stuff, right, we, what we can't do clearly from this data is say the law of attraction, new thought, the secret totally works, the Paralab proved it, right? That's what you hear. That's what people say in the public sphere. But this is the actual data from their lab. And so you can see that you can't say that, right? If you're a prolific female, you can say that maybe you can produce um, a result. But, you know, outside of that, you really, you know, you can't, you can't make any claims. Now, this next bullet point is very important in relation to the pair work. Deliberate decision was made not to engage in any forms of psychological testing, physiological monitoring, or strategy training reg regimens. In other words, they just basically had people that didn't claim any ability or any special ability sit down and take a crack at trying to, trying to make more ones or zeros, trying to make steel balls go more to one side of a, of a catcher container than another side. Um, they use water, um, all sorts of different stuff. And by the failure of various ANOVA analyses to identify other strong correlates other than operator intention and gender, right? So ANOVA is a statistical 
measure. Um, it's just basically used to try to figure out if there were uh, if there were effects that were caused by certain things. So in this case, it would be an effect caused by um, gender and, of course, intending more ones or intending more zeros, just as an example. And those are the only two things, basically, that they ever found produced a, a, st a statistically significant um, effect. All right, and there are lots of much more detailed analyses of the data, lots of much more detailed analyses that have been done um, by you know, really drilling down into individual operators where individual operators um, able to get there. But I just really wanted to just show you some of the raw data, some of the actual um, more scientifically talked about way of viewing this information because it is used so heavily. The pair lab is cited so widely as having sort of universally proven that the secret and the law of attraction and my manner interaction works. And in reality, you can even just see from this very high level data um, that that's not the case at all. Um, and that what's being proved are very, very specific things that cannot be generalized. 